Well, anybody who has questions to be answered or answers to be questioned, please right or left hand. <laughs> Uh, I'm intrigued with your nested uh, hierarchy of temporalities or causality. I'm just trying to understand for the first time. But, um, do you see properties that manifest themselves across multiple scales of temporality? In other words, that, 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 that go up and down the stack of hierarchies that are intrinsic to all. No, I wouldn't know what you mean by scales of temporality. What do you mean by scales of temporality? Well, when you talk about your proto-temporality and your... Oh, let's say your problem is a scale, yes. Okay, now about the nested hierarchy. Uh, do, now, let's rephrase your question with a small change. And would you say it again, what your question is, but use nested and temporality instead of scale. Okay, so your, your, your layers of temporality, one on top of another... Yes, um, not including, on the top, but including everything beneath. Okay. That is a nested hierarchy. Right. Yes. Are there um, properties that, that manifest themselves up and down the scale of that are, that are, that are scale free properties, if you will, uh, that, that you see repeatedly in different? Yes. So, are you asking whether this whole theory fits the idea of from down up or from up down? Because this has been said before. Are the realities of the world as we know it? And the down from up above, or under the evolved from a primitive subculture. <coughs> There's certainly something that is upon all levels absolute chaos. After absolute chaos, the highest starts starting with particle waves, there is a probability, and then probability in absolute chaos appear on the next level of determinism, uh, which then contains deterministic causation, probabilistic causation, and absolute chaos, then uh, uh, organic intentionality, and so forth. So it, the, cause, the type of causations become richer as we rise. To decide whether this is a preordained, uh, uh, this is uh, do something that has been handed down from an absolute final power, or whether something arises uh, by itself is really a matter of taste because you can do either and make sense of either. Well, yes, uh, this is a sort of follow up because I think I know where Tom is coming from. Um, it, if one thinks of the emergence of a new temporality, <laughs> the first biological organism. Or the first uh, coherent matter in um, Is there a, a, a consistent, is there something consistent in the strategy, as it were, or in the, the way in which a new emergence happens? And it seems to me that what you're saying is that yes, there is, and it is because of the uh, of a coming to crisis of constitutive confidence at that level. So, that in a sense, there is a sort of principle. That, 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 that runs through the, to the whole uh, the, the, the whole nested hierarchy, and that might even presumably to push it a little bit further, might even guide us if we think about the emergence of a higher temporality still. So to speak. You, you said it better than I could have, so thank you. Yes, <laughs> I, I would sum up my view in the title of the theory: the nested hierarchy of uh, unresolvable creative conflicts. <laughs> and that's something that in some ways was mentioned in the talk yesterday. Namely, that conflicts are unresolvable on the level where they appear, but they, by complexifying, by, is it a uh, uh, <laughs> by complexifying, uh, by complexifying, there's the mechanism to excuse the mechanical part of the word, uh, the mechanism of, of way of resolving those conflicts by the emergence of new, more complex processes, which then we associate with richer temporalities. 
And the, this leads us to the question of the, what have been called interfaces. How does this thing happen? Well, I think that's a different lecture, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Thank you. What resolves the conflict? So on a human level, we have someone comes up with extremely strange ideas. Yes. Uh, what resolves whether that is absorbed into the greater stability or whether it's just rejected? I think that the way I see or feel or react to your question is that it is your question is rooted in very contemporary in contemporary thought. There exist ideas, in fact, uh, quite a number of ideas and, and, and groups of people of uh, conflict resolution. The conflicts I'm talking about are not that tight. Uh, that is. Uh, Ripening and rotting cannot be identified with any ease in the contemporary world, for instance, because although the processes are there, they are just too complex. So to answer the question of what it is that, see that I understand what you are asking, and if not, then correct me. Uh, the uh, conflicts themselves become more complex and become, can be resolved only by, let me put it this way, by the emergence of a new language. Where by language, I mean new types of processes and new types of, of uh, structures. So I don't know, would you restate that, what, what is that you are looking for? What is the... Um, <coughs> you are trying to put forth a, uh, an idea that it's a dynamic process that constantly has um, various uh, opposing elements, the conflicting yes, elements. That's, uh, uh, and from there there's an emergent property which is the relative stability in each one of the levels you describe. But some of those perturbations must be pathological by nature. So at a, at a social level we might have a pathological effect um, which uh, society shrugs off, as it were. Um, yet at the same time, you might have some quite uh, strange and bizarre ideas that society absorbs. What is the deciding factor that says that a, anything of great, sufficiently great variability is pathological and therefore to be excluded from the, from the next emerging property? And what is then included? What's the, I, I, I do not see anything that I, I never use the word pathological because I regard conflicts whether horrible or uh, uh, maybe favorable to be favorably judged as part of the process of being, but of course then I have to define what I mean by being, which is not the same as the classical, uh, especially the theological definition of uh, uh, being. What, uh, you know, or what many people would regard as pathological, it's part of the pain of evolution. Uh, if you are asking for, and that's a very legitimate question, okay, out of these 14 pages, or so, so many volumes, what can we learn to solve uh, conflicts, let's say today, uh, which Many of us regard as undesirable. The answer is not there. <coughs> because the scheme is that of a, what you call it, I believe, dynamic uh, process, giving rise to systems more complex and temporally, and, and in the temporal sense, richer. One can ask, for instance, what kind of temporality may one foresee applicable to a globalized world instead of just it? So I've been speaking about socio-temporality, where society uh, did not say which particular society, any, any society. But where do we go from here? I don't have an answer to that. In fact, it is an emerging quality. Uh, which is 
being created right now by a first step, which according to this theory would be the definition of a global present. Now, in my latest book, there is a chapter that's called uh, Whose Past is Our Prologue? If the past is the prologue, well, fine. But there is profound disagreement about interpreting the past. Before there could be a plan for a world community, we have to agree on the prologue that we have to agree on what happened in the past. I don't have an answer which one, I have my preferences, but the uh, uh, first step toward some kind of conflict resolution, which I think you are searching for, or you want to have information you can use in your own, own thinking and integrate it, criticize it, or endorse it, or whatnot. Uh, I'd say the first thing is in the process establishing a, a, a global present so that if uh, somebody sneezes in the room, then somebody in Japan says, uh, uh, I'll soon right. So, uh, uh, that is in the process. But that is only the first step. Because once we have something which is a working global present, then we can start trying to agree with what happened in the past. And only then can we come up with anything that is likely to be workable enough to produce a, 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 a globalized, agreed on future. So far, that's, I hope, I think it's in the process, but I could not identify any further steps. I have a technical question. If there is no universal simultaneity, yes. how can the universe have a page? That has been asked many times. <laughs> because in the beginning there was a universal simultaneity. And in Wittrow's uh, natural philosophy, kind of a whole chapter on, on that. The question is very key, very interesting, and shows that you are totally in command of the details, but it has been asked before. This is a question really uh, to be answered by general relativistic cosmology. And that there is a question, there's an answer which to me is acceptable. And today there is, so what do I mean today? The today doesn't apply or a million years from now. The answer to that is, this paper somewhere where I say that nowness is a local phenomenon. In the beginning, in the very hot and very small dot, which is always described as a big bang, and it's a good name, but it's a very it, it's a big bang, it's a horrible big bang, but a horribly small thing. Uh, then it was possible to in fact uh, simultaneity simultaneity did make sense. The universe has a number of well-recognized numbers, such as nothing can be colder than absolute zero, nothing can go faster than speed of light, no meaning can be attached to time periods that are shorter than the time time, which is the time taken by light, crossing the diameter of a uh, classical electron. But it doesn't mean that we cannot write on a piece of paper numbers that should represent shorter periods, but we cannot assign any meaning in these numbers. So, so there is presumably a highest limit of the highest temperature. Nothing can be larger than the, than the universe. And there are some others. Now, during the last few decades, a new boundary emerged with the boundary to Question. Uh, that is, uh, the subtitle of my Google query, it is, but the exhibit there. Uh, the subtitle is Reports from the Boundary of the Universe. Now, what kind of boundary is If we could be, if we could live and write 
at absolute zero, then we could write a paper for this conference saying that's about time from the temperature boundary of the universe. As it happens, we cannot do it because long before that we would be frozen, rather, maybe that's the origin of things too. So uh, then uh, the same goes if we could be as large as the universe, we could send it on the boundary of the universe or something like that. So, but we are at the complexity boundary as far as we know. Now, this work is that I'm uh, referring to is part of my work, but the basis, part of the basis uh, of it, which uh, I even wrote down to make sure that I have it, Gerald Edelman, the Neurosciences Institute in La Boya. Uh, he uh, kept on emphasizing something I also emphasized, namely that the human brain is the most complex object we know of. Well, this needs a little bit of collaboration, sort of collaboration. By chance, that has no particular meaning. The number of neurons in the contemporary brain is roughly the same as the number of galaxies in the universe. Absolutely meaningless coincidence. But it's a very good example to introduce some thoughts about complexity because the galaxies of the universe cannot be coordinated to do anything together. Whereas the work of the brain consists of coordinating all these neurons to do something together. Now, uh, the idea of complexity has been around and it has an intuitively obvious meaning. A ladybug is immensely more complex than a uh, crystal. And a uh, lion or a bear or a bear cub uh, is immensely more complex than a ladybug. Everybody, of course, people can feel what's meant by this and has been used in that way. But how to measure that, that's a problem, especially if the measurement is to include different types of structures. Now, it was possible to uh, uh, derive a way of measuring this, something from, uh, from algorithmic uh, information theory that makes it possible to uh, derive a way of measuring complexity then looking at the various stable integrative levels of nature, particle waves, solid matter, uh, life, life and society, and come up with numerical uh, measures for these complexities. And in that table of, of the tabulation of complexities, the human brain uh, appears to be many, many orders of magnitude. In order of magnitude is a uh, multiple of 10, many orders of magnitude is more complex. And the physical universe itself, this is often, often uh, produces a kind of shaking of that. How can it be more complex than the physical universe? But uh, if one follows that measure, that way of measuring complexity, then it is. And it's kind of, and that's also Adolf's opinion. He's a neurologist and I'm not. Uh, so that answers the question of that came from here, but I don't know from whom or maybe the, from you. Okay, of course. Uh, I suggest you read the first chapter in my new book, which deals with complexity and its measure, and then render a critical assessment of what's being said.